Hello dear students, I am Dr. Moin. In this video, we are going to discuss about Differential Thermal Analysis DTA. This is part 2. In part 1, we have discussed the basics of Differential Thermal Analysis together with its instrumentation. I am attaching the link of part 1 in the description of this video, so you can watch it. In this video, we are going to discuss the applications of differential thermal analysis. So there are vast applications of DTA. So that is why these may be divided into two categories. Number one is physical changes and measurements. And number two is the chemical reactions. Then dear students, in the end, we will discuss two uh, DTA curves of two compounds in details in which we see what happens with the change in temperature what chemical changes occur in them so you need to watch this video till the end so first of all physical changes and measurements and in it, in it uh, we are going to see firstly the melting point determination melting point determination can be easily done over a wide range of temperature for example from n heptane which melts at minus 90 degrees centigrade to palladium at 1550 degrees centigrade. And this all can be done using a simple apparatus. And we get the results in the form of sharp mel melting peaks, which tells us the melting point of our sample. Another property which we can discuss using DTA is crystalline phase transition. So first of all, we'll see the introduction of this crystalline phase transition. So the crystalline form of a compound can greatly affect its properties like solubility, its density and various electrical properties. We also know that if a substance possesses two or more crystalline forms, then it is said to be a polymorphic then if the forms are stable over particular temperature ranges and have definite transition temperature mean the temperature at which one form is converted into another form then this type of system is said to be enantiotropic while if one form is stable but the other metastable means less stable other, other form is metastable over the whole range of temperature then the system is said to be monotropic and in this case the less stable form will always tend to transform to a more stable form so using DTA we can observe all of these crystalline phase transitions next application is to observe liquid crystalline transitions liquid crystalline state is of great importance in the preparation of display devices so it's been used it's being used in various electronic devices the liquid crystals represent various degrees of order within the liquid that is why it is called liquid crystals so if we change the temperature of a liquid crystal so there is the change in the order or arrangement of the particles inside so we can see from a very ordered solid we may progress to one of the various symmetric phases and these have plate like order or if you further continue to change in the temperature so you may get the nematic phase which have a rod like order or next to a cholesteric phase which is twisted nematic and finally we may get isotropic phase which is completely disordered liquid so this thing these things gonna happen when we change the temperature of some liquid crystals so these transitions may happen inside 
and all these changes can be observed using DTA. So we can study various phase diagrams as well. When more than one chemical components are present in our sample, the thermodynamics becomes more complicated. And same is, is the case with the melting behavior. That's to determine, determine the melting point, it also becomes complicated. The traditional way of studying the phase behavior of mixture was by cooling curves in which what was done actually there was the plotting they they plot temperature versus time as mixture cooled from the melt means the mixture was melt first it was made to melt first and then it was cooled and then plot was a graph was plotted between temperature and time so in this way this was studied but now DTA can give us more information which is more rapid these information can be gained in a very less time with smaller amount of samples provided the sensible conditions are used and what do you mean what do we mean by sensible conditions that is fairly slow heating rates preferably less than 10 Kelvin per minute should be used another property which can be discussed through DTA curve is glass transition temperatures below a certain temperature known as glass transition temperature the polymer segments don't have enough energy to rearrange themselves or to rotate themselves. Such a material is glass and it's brittle. And as the sample is heated, there is small increase in volume and its energy until the glass transition temperature is achieved where the chains become more mobile and the polymer is more plastic or rubbery like and if we continue heating further then the polymer may crystallize and then finally it melts so all of these changes can be well observed with DTA curves so these were various physical phenomena which can be studied using DTA curves. Now we will see various chemical reactions which can be studied by using DTA curves. For example, we can, we can discuss, we can study various dehydration processes, then decomposition processes, various polymer curing processes, then glass formations, and then oxidative attack on our samples. So these reactions can be studied using DTA curves. Now we will see the chemical reactions in some inorganic compounds. The dehydration, decomposition, and other reactions that take place within inorganic chemicals and minerals are among reactions which are studied by differential thermal analysis and what we get from this analysis we may obtain vital information about endothermic or exothermic nature of the reactions then we can detect melting and other phase changes occurring in those processes so we can conclude that DTA trace is an effective fingerprint of thermal behavior of a compound under particular conditions. So all of these points, these will be well understood to us. For this purpose, we'll take some examples in the upcoming slides. So first example is calcium oxalate monohydrate. So here is the DTA curve you can see on the right side. And these are actually the two curves. Means the experiment was run in two different atmosphere. So there are two curves A and B. 
A is for the sample which was run in nitrogen while B is the curve for the sample which was run in air. Sample quantity was 10 milligram and it was run in powder form and the heating rate was 10 Kelvin per minute. So now we see what gonna happen so we can see different peaks here. So the first endothermic peak you can see that is around 200 degree centigrade and that is due to loss of water is similar in both gases. You can see majority of the peaks are similar for both nitrogen and air environment and there is only one dissimilarity. So the first peak is similar in both cases in both environments nitrogen and air and that is appeared at 200 degree centigrade and what happened here you can see here's the chemical equation that there is removal of water molecule and monohydrate that is converted uh, into means the water molecule is removed from it okay so we continued heating our sample so in nitrogen the peak around 500 degree centigrade is also endothermic so you can see it's downward peak so it's endothermic and it corresponds to the breakdown of oxalate with the loss of carbon monoxide so what happened here actually the sample absorbed heat and there was the decomposition of calcium oxalate into calcium carbonate and carbon monoxide in case of nitrogen while when air was present in atmosphere the process was totally different so we got an upward peak which showed that the process was exothermic and actually what happened there since there was availability of oxygen so carbon monoxide produced that is oxidized into carbon dioxide so that is why the process became exothermic and we got an upward peak and if we talk about the third peak again we got a downward peak which was similar in both environments so the endothermic peak around 800 degree centigrade that is due to decomposition of calcium carbonate and is slightly affected by the change of gas means we can say it's almost similar in both environments and here's the decomposition of calcium carbonate you can see in the chemical equation so that is converted into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide the various effects on differential thermal analysis curve like change in heating rate sample mass and particle size atmosphere and gas flow rates so all of these effects have been thoroughly investigated via DTA curves. So here we are going to discuss another example and that is of copper sulfate pentahydrate. And here is the DTA curve you can see on the right side. And actually here are the two DTA curves. And why these are two DTA curves? Because copper sulfate pentahydrate, it has been run with two different types of pans so you can see here are the two DTA curves A and B so A is uh, A curve is achieved when we used unsealed pan and B is the curve when we used a pan that was sealed pan with pinhole and if we talk about the sample quantity so 6 milligram of sample was taken for each run and it was crystalline powder and the temperature rate was 10 Kelvin per minute and the atmosphere was flowing air so we got two DTA curves you can see uh, we got different peaks and all are downward showing different endothermic reactions and as we can see the copper sulfate is pentahydrate means there are five water molecules so definitely there is the gradual removal of water molecules so the initial loss of water may produce traces that seem different with different pans so it is clear from the two different peaks 
they are quite different from each other. A very open flat pan will give two broad overlapping peaks. It's talking about uh, DTA curve A. So you can see uh, it was run in a open flat pan. So there are two broad peaks and it, these are quite overlapping and their area is quite equal what do you say comparable and they are achieved at around what do you say 100 degree centigrade and if loss of water is restricted using a leaded pan with a small pinhole only the water may be retained and boil off separately giving a triple peak so you can see a totally different DTA curve which is obtained in case of B as compared to A. Calorimetric measurement on dehydration peaks give enthalpy change value, delta H values. So here are the reactions which we can conclude gonna happen in these what do we say different events. So in the first event or first peak it shows us that there is removal of two water molecules by the absorption of heat so copper sulfate pentahydrate molecule that is converted into copper sulfate trihydrate molecule and delta H which is going to happen here you can see on 100 degree centigrade that is 100 kilojoule per mole then second peak again here what do you say there is the removal of two water molecules and copper sulfate trihydrated molecule that is converted into copper sulfate monohydrate and the delta H and this peak is going to appear at 127 degree centigrade and delta H is 104 kilojoule per mole while the third peak which is quite away in DTA curve number curve A so you can see again there is the removal of last final water molecule and copper sulfate monohydrate that is converted into copper sulfate and this occurred at 237 degree centigrade and delta H for this reaction is 72 kilojoule per mole and finally the last peak you can see which is quite far away the sample here decomposes to oxide at high temperature so copper sulfate that is converted into oxide of copper with emission of sulfur dioxide and oxygen gas. So dear student this is all about today's lecture. Thanks for watching. Like my video and if you didn't subscribe my channel yet then subscribe it because a large number of videos are coming very shortly. So to keep in touch with my upcoming videos subscribe my channel and thank you very much.